Hello ladies and gents, and you're looking at Valence House Museum here, and through this wonderful place, fascinating place, I'm going to give you a pocket history of Barking and Dagenham, starting from the Neolithic period, with our first object, going through to the Romans, the medieval, and right up to modern times, and taking in a few things as well, like Barking Fair, and the old market, and things like that. So... We're going to go inside now and for our first object into the Neolithic era. Hello ladies and gents, <clears throat> you're looking at the Dagenham Idol. I couldn't help but do a separate video on this. This is a thousand years older than Stonehenge and this wooden figure discovered in the Dagenham's marshes is one of the earliest known carvings of a human form to have been found in Europe. Carved from the wood of a Scots pine its representation of a human figure was found in 1922 in marshland just south of Ripple Road, Dagenham. Dendrochronology treeing dating has revealed that it was made in about 2250 BC and belongs to the late Neolithic period. The gift to the gods. It was known about why the idol was made, but it, it is evidence that people inhabited this area over 4,000 years ago. Archaeologists believe that it was deliberately buried in the marshes as an offering to the gods to increase the fertility of the land. Buried beside the idol was the skeleton of a deer. At this time, people believed that the gods had to be kept happy with gifts in order to prevent disaster. You've just looked into the face of a figure carved over 4,000 years ago. It's very interesting, isn't it? To the Roman period, with the discovery of this stone sarcophagus and the human remains, which was found during the building of 496 Ripple Road in 1932. So we've jumped from Neolithic to Roman. And I always wonder, after seeing this, if the people who live in that house do have any odd or strange goings on there. It does make you wonder, doesn't it? living in a house where a Roman cemetery was found or was discovered. It's amazing what things just lie underneath your feet, isn't it? Isn't it? And to the next era, the Saxon to medieval, Norman to Tudor eras and Barking Abbey which we've already seen and covered well, so we won't go too much more into that. But these objects that we see here have newly been put out for the Christmas market that was at the house outside, because um, they knew the house would be busy. They've bought these objects out, and these are things that were found over the years at the various archaeological digs at Barking Abbey. So you've got everything from medieval tiles and pottery to clay pipes to Tudor pottery, what we're looking at here and the remains of jaws from two nuns taken from the nuns cemetery. In an age before sugar, they teeth must look discolored, but they didn't have too many cavities. And now we shall jump on to our next era. These things of Barking Abbey lead us nicely on to our next subject. 
Firstly, we start with the history of the market. A charter of King Henry II issued between 1175 and 1179, confirming the possessions of Barking Abbey, mentions the market and the marketplace outside. The marketplace is further mentioned in 1219 and 1456. The ownership of the market and full control thereof was held by the abbey until the dissolution when it passed into the manor of Barking and thus to the crown. The market, particularly the Christmas market, or Goosey Fair market as they used to call it, was a big thing in Barking and when the abbey was around, the abbess herself would come out processing with her nuns and she would bless, she would bless the market and she had full control over it to hand out both charity and punishments as well because she controlled all the weights and measures and made sure that no one was shortchanged. And if you were shortchanged and the person got caught doing it, you could well end up being pilloried on the abbey's pillory. But the nuns and the abbess generally kept a good relationship up with the local people. And the Christmas market was a big thing, it really was. Here we see an image from the Barking Ordinal which shows us an image of the Christmas market at Barking and above their services in the Abbey that would have been said and done around this time of the year. You can see people butchering down pigs in the market, thick with snow, and in the background there's the old bridge that goes over to the old mill. Here we rely on an AI-generated image to give us an idea of what the medieval to Tudor Barking Market would have been like. A very busy, bustling, noisy, smelly place. And here we see a medieval lady with her servant and she's being shown the goods. Barking was a fairly comfortably off town. It had good links to London, both by road and by river, because you had the river roading which connected to the Thames. So the market would have been well supplied. So you would have had lots of different things for both rich and poor, all sights, smells and sounds. And in the Tudor era, and building up to it, what would a bit of Christmas entertainment have been like in a market like Barking? I'll show you a little something like that now.
hope you all enjoyed that little bit of late medieval to Tudor entertainment. It's just a little gist of the kind of stuff you would have got going on in the market. And we're back to our historical images now. This is Bark in Essex in 1610. It's a copy of a much older portrait. Um, this one was painted by Thomas Wakeman. And this and the next few images that you're going to see are in the property of Valence House Museum. But in this image you can see over to the left the old Tudor courthouse or market house as it was also known. In the middle you've got the tower, bell tower of good old St Margaret's Barking. And over to the right the other buildings, Barking and all the people going about their business. And if you look in the middle just going down East Street you can see the startings of the market stalls and booths. So that's a nice little look back to the past. And if you were to go to the same area today and try and find anything from this image, the only thing still standing from this image that you can see is the church tower of Bark in St Margaret's. Another portrait by Thomas Wakeman, and this is the old houses and marketplace at Barking in Essex. Barking Abbey. Thomas Wakeman again, <clears throat> showing the curfew gate, the little hotel, and the bell tower you can see of St Margaret's there. Now in the 18th century, the market declined. Come the 19th century, it was pretty much gone. You had the odd stall outside shops and things like that. And for a long time, the market stayed that way. Here we're seeing the old market house or courthouse 1880 this image dates from over to the left you can just see the church tower of St Margaret's peeping through there lovely Victorian portrait this one I like this and a brilliant photograph I like this one because there's a lot going on you've got the kids and everything in the picture um, this is circa 1890s but the hotel over to the left, if you look at the bay windows, if you look into its upper window, it's got good beds for men, only sixpence per night. And this is Barking Mills, and the river roading, and the quay at Barking. And this is where a lot of the goods that would have been sold at the market would have landed. Uh, it's a, a nice little portrait, and a photograph to show you it in later times this is the latter Victorian era and as you can see it was still a busy hive of activity in those days and a completely different world to the one we see now anyway that's the history of Barking Market which as I say finished in the 18th century and luckily was revived using its ancient charter in 1991 now I'm going to take you to our next bit of history and then we'll be seeing what remains or what the modern day Barking Market afterwards but our next bit of history is Barking Fair or Fairlock Fair and for that to start off with that I shall take you back to Barking St Margaret's and to the grave of the fair's founder once we've done that we'll be going to Valence House Museum where you'll be joining me in the 1930s in a 1930s kitchen to hear the voices of people who were old in the 1930s and remembered the Barking Fair which was banned in the 1870s so off we go now for the history of Barking slash Philop Fair and for to begin our story with we look back at an old piece of Barking Barking Key which is still there but very much a lot of it has gone um, this would have been the type of barking key that our man Daniel Day who founded Fairlock Fair would have recognised and it's integral as part of our story so this is where we will begin because as you will find out Daniel Day did not wish for his body to be conveyed by road so it was brought here instead and this is very much the type of thing that he would have recognised in life and those conveying him down the river roading from London would have recognised and known in death. The only things still remaining in our time that are seen in this image is the bell tower of St Margaret's that you can see over towards the right. The mill and all that kind of stuff, that's all gone. But 
if you look at this later photograph, which is the 19th century, the latter 19th century, Barkentown Quay, right over to the far left, if you notice the key buildings there, they are the building, the one right over to the very furthest left, that is all that remains of the key in our own world today. So, we've had a little look at the past and the barking key that Daniel and his mourners would have recognised. Now join me back in the present as we begin our journey from here over to Barking St Margaret's to the grave of Daniel Day, the founder of Fairlock Fair. Hello ladies and gents, and to take us back to the history of the Fairlock Fair, I drag us back into the present and then I'll be dragging us our pretty little backsides back into the past. We're at Barking Key now and the only original thing that remains is the building, the image we started off with. This one, the old quayside building. And the history of Fairlock Fair begins with a man called Daniel Day. And this man had been overturned in his carriage and thrown off of his horse so many times that he developed a lifelong and even deathlong horror of any type of transport by road and gave strict instructions that his body, once dead, was not to be conveyed from London down to Barking here by road. So up the Thames and down the river roading into Barking Quayside it came. Daniel Day, on the 25th of October, 1767. And we know from the church book that the funeral service occurred in the late afternoon, early evening time, about four of the clock and that the funeral, being a private gentleman, was at no cost to the parish. They noted that down in those days, whether you cost them a bob or two when you died or not. But yeah, that music you can hear is someone playing, and they are very good, playing a mandolin. There he is. Anyway, back to our main port of call, which is I'm going to be taking you on the journey of Daniel Day's last journey, actually, as he sailed from London up the River Thames and down the River Roding to avoid travelling by rail and being overturned that one last time his body was brought here. This, what you see, all this lot, the new bank and everything, that defends the town from flooding when the barrier and everything went up. The quayside was lost. And it's only original building, that's the one we're looking at. So, I'm going to pause you for a sec while I stand and listen to this lovely music and finish off my smoke. And then we'll be taking the same journey as Daniel Day and going to visit his grave. A little bit of music fits in well with our fair theme. I should say, before we go to Daniel's grave, at Barking, has had a fair for many hundreds of years. The old Barking fairs, the Goosey Fair and the Christmas Market Fair, they were founded, of course, by Barking Abbey. We've focused quite a lot on the Abbey, so we're gonna be focusing on this fair, the Fairlock Fair, founded by this man in the 18th century who we're going to visit now. I love this little part of Barking. I often come here myself because a lot of my ancestors that lived in Barking were eel fishermen and lived along this way. And some, I may say so, pretty grotty looking houses that were pulled down under slum clearances. Now you have to imagine Daniel's coffin. Bear in mind the Fairlop Oak, an old oak tree, where the Fairlop Fair gets its name from. Daniel's coffin was made from a branch of this 
and this is where the old entrance into the town up the quay would have been from the quay would have been so they would have hauled his body off of the boat or barge whatever he was conveyed in back into the town and they would have walked him over and it is recounted they walked the short distance we're going to walk now and I shall be taking you there How well that music carries over the quay. Even the newer buildings here that have gone up here, these ones, they've built in keeping to keep in with the old one, which is nice. It's cold and windy today. I finished off my Eastbury series. I filmed it once before, but a while, a little while ago, and I was totally unhappy with the filming. So I went back and did it again. I was just focusing on the descriptions with the camera, and even with my reading glasses on, I couldn't read them. So I wouldn't present videos like that to you ladies and gents. So as poor as my reading may be at times, and my eyesight, you've got me reading out the descriptions. I have discovered something though, that if, white text or light coloured text is on a dark background I can actually see it really well so I think a trip to the opticians may be in order Bark in St Margaret's there she lies over there This is Abbey Road we're on, and this road did not exist in the time of Daniel. We're very lucky with Daniel's gravestone, because other than in the summer, where you can only mar mark out, make out some slight words of the word Fairlop, his, his gravestone is worn smooth. But thankfully to monumental inscriptions, Hopefully they didn't run over any kind of roads of Daniel's coffin. Yeah, thankfully to monumental inscriptions, which was done in the 1930s, it marked down all the legible gravestones in the churchyard. And this didn't just happen in Barking, it was a, pretty much a nationwide thing that started going on. People started getting into their history and realised that the inscriptions on these stones were fast fading. And without them being noted down, these people's memories would be lost. So Daniel's was... They're all marked on a map. If you go to Valence House Archives, which I did recently, you can view the Monumental Inscriptions book. Even in 1932, it was very worn, very, very worn away. So we know Daniel Fairlop, where he's buried, because it's marked on a map. Also a website that covers the history of Fairlop Fair that illustrated the grave with a picture. So it was very easy to line up with the curfew tower. And you have to imagine a, I should imagine, fairly solemn procession, although he was not a solemn man. He liked his cheer, did Daniel. I have the information on my other phone in my other pocket. In your classic archetypical, here's one I prepared earlier mode. This gate did exist at the time, and it's highly likely that he may have been carried through this way. They may have taken him through the curfew gate with a fancy funeral. It's, it's more than likely the curfew gate, but I'm walking you through here. So about four of the clock on the 25th of October, 1767, a very well attended funeral procession would, would have made its way in here. It was a popular man, Fairlop Fair. People came from London to attend that because part of the pageantry of it was boats on wheels would be drawn along the Mile End Road and would slowly make their way down to Barking and would become part of the Fairlop Fair. And you'd have Londoners tagging it all the way. 
as the old tableau went. Hey, hey, ho, ho, the fear has come to town with pomp and song and laughter and drunk men falling down. Daniel's service would have taken place inside the church and by the time that happened it would have more or less been getting dark. I found in the old days the gentry and those well off tended to be buried of an evening. Samuel Pepys was, loads of the royals there, they were all buried by evening. So yeah, I don't know why but my dad suggested it to me maybe so that everyone was available to attend the funeral if people did work or it could have just been simply to distinguish them from the working classes their funerals that took place in the day and here we are the grave of Daniel Day 1767 and as you can see the writing is all but completely worn away in the summertime, you can just about make out the word Fairlop. And from the picture I saw online of the grave, you can line it up perfectly. And then looking at the burial map to make double sure, because I don't like to get things like this wrong, this is the grave of Daniel. So I'm going to pause you a minute while I get the other phone out. And uh, full credit to the London dead for me being able to match up that image and find Daniel's grave. As I said, I did double check it with Valance House and, and this is the one. But London Dead, this is the description and it's very accurate as well. Wind, weather and time has reduced Daniel Day's gravestone to an almost featureless slab of lichen and moss encrusted rock. All traces of his name has been eroded away. But if you look carefully, you can just about make out the letters Airlo, all that remains of the word Fairlop. Day was buried here in Barking Churchyard in 1767. Because he had developed a horror of horse-drawn transport after being thrown from his carriage and then thrown from his horse, even in death he refused equine assistance. He was brought by a barge from Wapping along the River Thames, up Barking Creek, the River Roding and into the town and then carried the short distance to St Margaret's by six journeymen block and pump makers. His coffin was made from a gigantic branch of Fairlop Oak, a tree he had made famous by the founding of Fairlop Fair. So that's the first little bit of the story and now off into the past again for the historical evidence. It was a rowdy event this fair, it really was, and it got banned in the end for that reason. We'll start off in the 1700s of course when the fair began and that will take us through to the 1870s when the fair ended. But further still can we go on with that because from there we'll be going to Valence House Museum to a 1930s kitchen built as part of the Homes for Heroes post-World War development thing, these homes, and it shows a 1930s kitchen. But while we're looking around this 1930s kitchen, because remember, this isn't just about fairs and things, this is a pocket history of Barking and Dagenham. So while we're looking around this kitchen, we hear the memories of two people who were fairly elderly in 1930s when they recounted these in newspapers and that, and they tell you about all the fun of the fair. We also have some earlier accounts, one from the 1700s when the justices of the peace and people had to get involved because of the uproarious nature of the fair and everything that it caused. So that will take us through there and then to Valance House. Then once we've finished there, because we talk of fairs and we think of these things and markets, I mean we've covered the market, we've covered the fair, we think of these things being old and dead and gone. And in many ways they're not, and in many ways the Christmas traditions that our ancestors and forebears enjoyed, we still enjoy today. So, off into the past as we look at a little bit something more cheerful than the gravestone and Fairlop Fair, and this lovely man that founded it. And before we zip off into the past and the merrymaking aspect of Fairlop Fair, and the Fairlop Oak, and that kind of thing, and remember this is a pocket history, so it isn't just about that. After that, we'll go through the history of the fair right up to the 1870s when it was closed. And even beyond that, as we go further on with our pocket history into the 1930s kitchen, where we'll hear the memories of two people who remembered the farewell. 
and then be in the pocket history after that I'll take you to a 1940s wartime living room where you'll hear some radio broadcasts relating to the war then after that you'll experience a air raid shelter Anderson shelter experience with me then from there we go back into our own time but before we leave Daniel's grave this is the original copy of the burial registers for Barking St Margaret's October 1767 and if you go all the way down the list to where I've put the blue arrow the 25th of October Daniel Day doesn't give a lot of details at this era they weren't writing as much details as some of the previous and yet to come vicars or administrators did it was short and sweet and they got the job done but yeah as we see Daniel was buried on the 25th of October <coughs> 1767 so that's a little bit of the original documentation and as I said at the grave now for something a little bit more cheerful as we go off into the history of Fairlock Fair so join me for part two click on that as we go on with our pocket history and now to the history of Fairlock Fair and we begin with this amazing object this is a broadsheet celebrating Fairlock Fair held annually on the first Friday in July the broadsheet gives a short account of the origins of the fair and produces two songs one sung by Mr Hemingway and the other sung by Mr Liddard during the fair and shows the festivities in an impressive woodcut which was printed from a block of wood fashioned from a piece of the celebrated Fairlop Oak itself Let me see the origins of Fairlop Fair and Co. Taken from an original drawing by an eminent artist and printed off a block cut engraved on a block of the celebrated tree. And here it goes on for the the songs. And right at the very bottom, a few years before Mr. Day died, his favourite oak lost a limb out of which he procured a coffin to be made for his own interment and would often use to lie down in it to try how it would fit him. He died on October the 13th, 1767, aged 84, and his remains were conveyed to Barkin by water, pursuant to his own request, accompanied by six journeymen block and pump makers. To each of them he bequeathed a new leather apron and a guinea. So that's the first thing that we should begin with. This famous woodcut made from the famous oak itself. And this tree in the 1700 was to be, was believed to be well in excess of eight to nine hundred years old. So that takes it way, 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 way back. And a shame it was lost, eh? To the oak itself. The Fairlop Oak was an ancient and monstrously huge tree. At three feet from the ground, it measured 36 feet in girth. It was divided into 11 vast arms and overspread an area of 300 feet in circuit. This pride of the forest which was so many years overshadowed with its verdant foliage, the thousands who crowded under it, and the antiquity of the tradition of the country traced it about it, traced it to about the ninth century. So, as I say, it was a very old tree. Um, this gigantic wonder gave shelter to the first Friday in July to a well-known and well-loved Fairlop Fair. In the 1720s, Daniel Day of Wapping would ride out to his small estate and he owned Fairlop on the first Friday of July to collect his rents. According to G. Woodgate in a letter to the editor of the East London Observer in 1867, he invited, this is Daniel Day, invited many of his friends to a bean feast and bacon which he doled out to them from inside the hollow tree. 
Much bacon and several sacks were consumed this way. In the course of a few years, other parties came. These increasing booths were erected and various articles bought to sell. The fair became a great East End institution with gaming tables, drinking booths, boxing matches, roundabouts, travelling theatres and fortune tellers. Daniel Day had a boat built complete with masts and rigging but constructed to run on wheels and drawn by a pair of greys in which he rode to the fair from Wapping via Mile End, Bow, Stratford and Ilford. Imitators also constructed boats bigger and more ornate than the original drawn by the teams of up to six horses. The return of the boats to Wapping from Hainault on Friday night became a carnivalesque occasion with crowds lining the streets back into London to watch the boats illuminated by coloured fires and accompanied by a brass band. And <clears throat> this is the only really legible bits of his gravestone that you can see. The Airlo of Fairlop and Daniel Day, 1683 to 1767. Mr. Day died in October the 19th, 1767. His remains were carried by water in a coffin made from the wood of a large branch of the Fairlop Oak, which had broken off just a short time before his death. He desired to be buried at Barking Church. Having once been thrown off his horse and at other times overturned in his wheel carriage, he took a dislike to both, and thus the funeral took its course on the silent highway, which is the River Thames and the River Roding. Six journeymen block and pump makers followed him, to whom he bequeathed a new liver apron and a guinea each. The founder of the fair was a remarkable and benevolent man. He never married, but had few innocent eccentricities and was kind to the children of his sister. He had a female servant, a widow, who had been 28 years of him. As she in life had loved two things especially, her wedding ring and her tea. He caused her to be buried with the former on her finger and a pound of tea in each hand when she died. The latter circumstance being more remarkable as he himself disliked tea and never used it. He had few small aversions, but no resentments. He was always shocked when he heard about people or anyone going to law. He gave much away and was continually lending money to deserving persons, charging no interest for it. Mr. G. Woodgate, the East London Observer. And this is a little piece from, because there are no, no images that we know of, of Daniel Day from his time. And this is taken from the last, one of the last of the Fairlock frigates, one of those wheeled boats, um, small scale ship on wheels, used in the Fairlock Fair Parade. This masthead is believed to represent the founder of the fair, Daniel Day. So... That's what we shall end off with that little bit with. And this is the Fairlop Oak in its latter years. The oak outlasted Daniel Day by a mere half century, a mere twinkling of an eye in the life of a tree. The once magnificent oak was mortally sick by the end of the century. William Forsyth, gardener to George III, was paid a nominal sixpence in 1799 to apply curative plasters made from cow dung, ceiling lime, wood ash, river sand and burnt bones to the remaining healthy wood after all the dead and decaying branches had been cut off. A sign was affixed to the tree saying, All good foresters are requested not to hurt this old tree. A plaster having lately been applied to its wounds, Despite the valiant attempt at treatment, the oak continued to die. By 1805, it was a huge hollow shadow of its former self, in which several cattle could take shelter. Picnickers 
took to sheltering and lighting fires inside the oak, and eventually and inevitably one fire burned out of control for almost 24 hours, inflicting further irreparable damage to the by then barely living tree. On a fair day in 1813, an elderly gentleman paid a boy two shillings and sixpence to pluck the last green sprig grown from the tree's crown. In 1820, a gale finally brought down the dead oak, crashing it to the ground. Mr. Seabrook, a builder currently engaged at the time in the building of St. Pancras New Church, purchased some of the better preserved timber from the oak and used it con to construct a pulpit which still stands in the church to this day. So here we see poor Fairlop Oak in its last days. William Forsyth who tried to save it. And now I take you on to the next part of our pocket history which takes us further on in time. Still memories of the fair. Um, you'll join me at Valence House Museum a mere 24 years after Daniel Day's death and we get to hear one of the reasons why eventually the fair would be closed down because it was so uproarious. So join me for that bit now. say how shocking and that's eventually why it got banned and that takes us nicely on to the next part of our pocket history which takes us into the 1930s to the 1930s kitchen where we hear the memory of people or the memories of people recounting back to the 1870s the fair and when it was eventually closed so, join me at Valence House Museum in the 1930s kitchen for that now. Chiefs. 
centre, they contain the various shows, stalls, shooting galleries and travelling theatres, occupied the whole of the west side of North Street from the George Inn to the London Road, while the horses, donkeys, etc. was distributed all over town. It was very amusing to see the fishermen and their wives having donkey rides. On the horse pond, adjoining the old Abbey Wall, generally stood Woonwell's travelling menagerie, and opposite the George generally stood Frederick's travelling theatre. But there came a time when some of the religious bodies decided, if possible, to rid Barking of one of its most ancient festivals, and accordingly they managed to get a numerously signed petition which was sent to the Home Secretary, who issued an order for its abolition. The last fair was held in 1874, and in October 1875, the police were stationed at the roads leading into the town and turned back the showman, who evidently was not aware of this new order. you've all enjoyed the 1930s kitchen and this 1940s living room having a little wander around and a little look back into the past is something oh shit we better get ourselves into a shelter hadn't we ladies and gents join me outside for that
Well, there's the all clear so we can get out of this shelter, back off into the modern world and leave the world, the uh, war behind and we continue on with our pocket history. Welcome back to 2023 and we leave the wartime experience behind that was done in all seriousness to show us what our parents, grandparents, great grandparents had to put up with and that, those air raids, that sound was actual genuine air raid sounds recorded by the BBC and those air raids are what wiped away great swathes of Barking and Dagenham and so we leave the grave of Daniel Day behind, the founder of Fairlop Fair and we head into the modern world of barking and nowadays we often say a lot of us do oh the good old days and things aren't what they were and something my nan said to me once it weren't always the good old days for all of us boy <coughs> if you were poor and you had it pretty shitty particularly before the welfare state kicked in so yeah there were good times of course like the fairs, the markets, but just like nowadays, that world could be an extremely dangerous place. There are records in the burial records of Barking St Margaret's here, of people either murdered at the fairs or markets, or found dead in the street, choked on their own vomit, all sorts of things, but it had to be buried in this churchyard. So, not much has changed in some respects. And we go through the curfew gate one of the few things which actually has taken in all that history and all those memories if walls could talk eh? and we look out onto the modern East Street and the modern day Barking Market This road that the cars are going along is the London Road. Up there would be North Street and where the George would have been. And before we head off into the modern world, we can have one hark back to the old world and the memories of Barking Market, which owes its origins way back in the medieval period with that charter of King Henry II when he handed over the governance of it to the abbess of Barking Abbey. And here we see the market as it would have looked or been <clears throat> in around the year 1500. A busy, bustling market, very much like the markets of today. Admittedly, people don't dress like this any longer, thank goodness. But our markets aren't all that different, really. You can see the little stalls at the back with all the geese hanging up, and that would have been in preparation for the upcoming Christmas Goosey Fair Market. I absolutely love this image because you can see the curfew gate in it. And that curfew gate is the one thing, surviving thing, that links our world with theirs. The courthouse over to the left, the stalls that we see here, the stocks, even the people and their memories are all gone. But that curfew gate links us to them and that's a real piece of history. And also memories of extract from Mr. Frogley's barking. The fair was distributed all over the town, but the chief centre that contained the various shows, stalls, shooting galleries, and travelling theatres occupied the whole of the west side of North Street from the George Inn to the London Road. While horses, donkeys, etc. was distributed all over town. It was very amusing to see the fishermen and their wives having donkey rides. On the horse pond, adjoining the old Abbey Wall, generally stood Woonwell's Travelling Menagerie, and opposite the George generally stood Frederick's Travelling Theatre. But there came a time when some of the religious bodies decided, if possible, to rebark in one of its most ancient festivals, and accordingly, 
they managed to get a numerously signed petition which was sent to the Home Secretary who issued an order for its abolition. The last fair was held in 1874 and in October 1875 the police were stationed at the roads leading into the town and turned back the showman who evidently was not aware of this new order. And the fair did go in 1874, but luckily it came back in the 1930s. With the building of the Beckentry Estate, after the First World War, post-war Homes for Heroes schemes, as that community grew, they wanted events, and they put those events on. The Barking Fair came back, and this is an image from the 1930s from one of the Barking Fairs. And it's a reenactment after the Battle of 1066, and it shows the nuns of Barking Abbey with the abbess at their head, kneeling and paying homage to King William the Conqueror. And that is a real event that took place in Barking, because William the Conqueror stayed at the abbey while the building of the White Tower, the Tower of London, was happening. So luckily, the fair came back. And. And that curfew gate that you could see in the 1500 image of the market that's really uh, all that remains from that little world but the market went as we learned in the latter 18th century the market declined and luckily the market by its ancient charter came back in 1991 and we're looking at its modern incarnation now and if we can cross this road safely which i think we can yeah we're going to the modern day East Street and the modern day Barking Market. The market is closed today. Um, I wouldn't film a busy market scene because there's loads of people around. But anyone that knows the area well will know that where the market is you get stalls on either side of the street that run both ways. So the old Tudor market may be gone. There may not be geese running around anymore and nuns or abbesses blessing the place, there might not be anything like that, but there is still a market, and still in its traditional place, which it has been for many hundreds of years, which is great. I like that kind of continuity. And other traditions as well, like the Barking Fair that we saw, that was canceled in the 18th century, sorry, in the 19th century, that came back in the 1930s, didn't it? And many of the traditions that we have today hark back to the times of our ancestors many years ago a lot of those traditions the decorations that we use they didn't have the tinsels and modern colorful papers and lights of today but they certainly celebrated their Christmas in a way that we would we would recognize and for our next location we will have to go further off right down that way towards Dagenham on a number five bus to Valence House Museum, that wonderful place that helped us put all this together. And you'll join me at a modern day Christmas market where we'll get to meet one of our lovely page members, Diane. I bought a little sink off her stall which will feature in a Christmas decoration, a green bower for a mantel shelf which you'll see. So off we go towards Dagenham and Valence House and the modern day equivalent of the Barking Christmas Market. And as you see, there's still things very much like that going on today with the lovely Christmas market.
Yeah. Get your rabbits in there. Off Diane, yeah. There we are. One of our lovely cage members. I've just bought my bits as well. It's warm in here, isn't it? Surprisingly. Yeah, it's warm, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's great to come here at 9 o'clock. Oh, You'll be glad to get home, wouldn't you? <laughs> and here we are. I said I would uh, show you the Christmas decoration or the green bower that the thing I bought of Diane became part of. And this is something I do every year. Christmas is the one festivity that I really enjoy and sort of throw myself into wholeheartedly. So. Got a few bits and bobs on here. I make one of these up every year kind of thing, different themes and whatnot. I do like these. And what I got off of Diane's stall is this Remember Me. Pause to read if you want to. I like to include mementos and personal stuff. This is another thing I bought off of another stall. Off of another stall I got these handmade oh yeah, sorry knocked him down. Handmade glass Christmas bubbles. That nan one there, I like that. This was Linda's, this glass elephant. Rabbits, because I always kept rabbits at one point. And I always like to incorporate a little something myself in this, and I love pocket watches. This is a chiming one. I got this during the COVID epidemic, cheap. It's no longer cheap, put it that way. <laughs> Another one I got during the COVID epidemic. So yeah, it's the Christmas decoration, fire going, and something I would like to end us off with is a message to us, the future, from the Book of Barking. So, here we go. And I enjoyed that with that little 1930s nod to the future. I thought I'd end us off with our own nod to the future. And what you were going to hear, they are the future. So look after them well. And I hope you've all enjoyed this pocket history of Barkingham Dagnam. Wishing you all a very, very happy Christmas. And thank you all for your support on the page. Take care all, and I'll see you all in the next video. Yeah, you heard a little bit of the practicing from St Margaret's School, which I thought was very nice. Song and music, I think Daniel Day would have liked that. <laughs>